everybody, and welcome back to another episode of ePROcast. I'm your host, Eugenie Procopi, and in this episode, I had a great opportunity to chat with Scott Minto, the director of the MBA Sports Management Program at San Diego State University. Um, we had a great chat about American business model in both pro sport and college sport. Also, he gave his uh, perspective on what the European model can borrow from American model. And also he shared his top skill set that would help you to get into the sports business industry. I hope you get a lot of value out of it. Enjoy. And I have alongside me, Scott Minto, the director of the sports MBA program at San Diego State University for 13 years now. And also at the same time, how we met, um, it was in Madrid at our uh, MBA program. So that was a really nice time. And actually, we've been in touch ever since then. And Scott, thanks, thanks a lot for joining the podcast and, uh, you know, uh, joining, joining and share all your, all your insights. Uh, if you can just dive right into and share your story and, and your background. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Gene, for having me on. It's really, uh, it's been great listening to the previous podcasts, and I'm always thrilled to to keep in connection with former students who are doing great things in the sports industry. So when I saw that you had my good friend Pedro Diaz Rodel on to talk about his work in the management and leadership space uh, in his book, um, and I was just been really thrilled to to get to know him over the years of of teaching in the Universidad Europea Real Madrid Graduate School. Um, but yeah, as a, as a full-time gig, I am the director of the Sports MBA program at SDSU. Uh, like you said, I've had this job since 2007, which sounds like a really long time. But I was a, a student in the very first class at SDSU in 2005. And I joined an, the program as a student looking to break in the sports industry. I, I, I'm, I'm from Rhode Island originally. Um, you know, so most people know it internationally from like Family Guy and the Farrelly Brothers movies like Dumb and Dumber, um, but Rhode Island is a, is a small state and a great place to, to visit. My folks are still there. I, I ended up at Georgetown University, home of the Hoyas, to do my, uh, my undergraduate studies. I have a bachelor's in foreign service uh, and international degree. Um, very, very different from sports, but I, I knew that I wanted to work in the sports industry in an international context, so I'm really happy um, to be talking to someone from here in San Diego over in Moldova uh, with a big time difference. And it's really a wonderful thing to see, you know, the progress um, that, that, that my career has been able to make while, while I can stay in touch with former students. So um, coming to the Sports MBA program, um, I was just eager to work in sports in, in an international capacity and in any kind. I wasn't really too specific, but what what drew me to the program was the San Diego State University's partnership with the San Diego Padres, who are the baseball team here in town. Um, and they were looking to add quality and, and new, new ideas to their front office. So they partnered with the university, which, which brought me to the program, uh, much like I would assume the Real Madrid partnership with Universidad Europea brought you to Spain to study for your master's. So um, I took over the program about a year after I graduated. So the program did not have a full-time dedicated director until I came along. And my goal in taking over the program was specifically make the program more global in scope, um, branch out past baseball. We still have a great relationship with the Padres, but we're not necessarily a, a, a partner um, on, you know, on, on our website and all those things. We, we have alumni that work there and they've been really great to us and gracious and wonderful with our students, but we don't have a, we're not a baseball program. Um, you know, you and I are going to talk a lot about rugby and European sport and all those things. So I'm really excited to be able to get to do that and not just focus on, on one little area of business. So uh, the, the program has been a lot more international in the, the 12 plus years that I've been running it. And we're also very, very focused on quality. So we, we want really good students. We want to train them as best we can, and we want them to go be successful in the industry. So my background to date is, uh, is been largely in the education space. Most of my career has been kind of helping others succeed and grow in their career. And I, and I love that. That's a, that's a part of the industry um, that I think is really continuing to grow uh, is the education space. Sports is such a massive global industry. Um, people that understand it well and know the language of sports and, and are connected in sports and have experience in sports is 
um, are always going to be in high demand. And I, I really appreciate you know, the ability to work with those types of people on a daily basis. Yeah, so definitely a lot of international students in the uh, MBA program that I was in, in Real Madrid. What about uh, SDSU? How, the pro how versatile and how international the program is and how, um, you know, how many countries you, you have on the record? You know? it's, uh, that's a great question. It's not nearly as global of a, of a student body as you would, you would see in a European uh, program like Real Madrid MBA or others. Um, largely because I think it's pretty expensive um, and it, it is a very, very difficult um, thing to afford. Uh, it's almost 50,000 US dollars and uh, that's a major, major commitment uh, for international students. We probably average around 20% to 25 maybe international students in a good year. We've had students from all over the world, from from. Uh, Europe, from Asia. Uh, we had a woman from South Africa who just graduated, you know, a year ago. We have, uh, we've had students from Australia, you know, all, all, all parts. But I think the Real Madrid <laughs> affiliation is just such a global thing that it attracts, um, it attracts students from every corner of the world, like moths to a flame. Like that, that is one of the major selling points. And the reason I, I love the teaching over there is because it is like a mini United Nations in that classroom. And it is remarkable to see how many, you know, friendships develop and, and how cultures are broken down and, and, and friendships are forged over, over the shared love of a sport, not even necessarily Real Madrid or football, but, but just the shared love of sport in general. Um, so that's just a, a, like a, a great thing. And, and in my program, it's similar, but um, our students, though they're typically from, you know, 75, 80% from the United States, you know, they have a deep, appreciation for global sports so you'll see um, on breaks during class you'll see students streaming you know world cup matches or epl or champions league matches um, on the on the monitors in the classroom so it's really great um, you know as well to see our students and when we have international students um, to, to see like you know sharing hey guys i'm going to explain cricket to you uh, or i'm going to i'm going to talk to you we're going to try out this sport or i'm going to tell you about kabaddi and like explain how it, how it works so it's really really wonderful um but the international scope although we don't have necessarily a lot of international students on an annual basis i would love for there to be more of course um but we go to the dominican republic every year as a as a class trip so a developing country going to a, a spanish-speaking nation taking students outside of their comfort zone i mean that's that's as big as it gets for me in terms of uh, exposure of, of our largely American student body to something that's, that's a multicultural context and, and sport is the, is the river that runs through all of that. Right, I remember your, um, when you came to Madrid and uh, you know, during our classes, I remember two partnerships that you guys uh, introduced us to. It was, uh, you said some of, some of you guys were introduced to Nike in Oregon and the other partnership was with uh, World Surfing Federation or League or something like this, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th there's, it, that's the great thing about you know, being in Southern California. We have, our students can be exposed to anything. And we have, you know, students that, that come to this program and say, like, I want to work in surfing. Or, you know, and we say, great, you know, the, the action sports community here in San Diego is probably employs employs more people than our traditional sports industry um, now we have a baseball team here we have a hockey team we have now a, a few different um you know uh mid-tier uh, or, or upper mid-tier usl um football team actually uh, coached by landon donovan the former u.s men's national team star so there's a lot of traditional sport here but there's a lot of people who go off and have great careers working in things like surfing or things like um, the apparel industry that, that, that Southern California is known for. So it's, it's really nice. We, we, we don't, certainly don't discriminate, but we have a lot of students that, that maybe come here looking to work in football and then pivot. And next thing you know, they're working in, uh, you know, for U.S. ski and snowboard, or they're working for, um, you know, Vail Resorts or something like that, doing, doing surfing and, I'm sorry, uh, doing skiing and, and snowboarding for a living. So it's, it's kind of neat. And, and Southern California just affords, a luxury of you can you can find anything within a few hours drive here in Southern California. Absolutely. So moving into American sports uh, business model, um, I will I'll, I have to to say it's unique, and 
be, I've been there a couple of times and with our program at Real Madrid, we also had a trip for about four to five days in New York where we met different organizations and it was amazing. Um, how is how is the how is American sports business model different from European in your vision? And what actually us European can learn from that? Ooh. Ooh, how much time do you have? Well, I think <laughs> the, the key, the, one of the, the most interesting things about the American sports business as a whole is, you know, this country is capitalist almost to a fault with almost everything. And it's socialist with its sports. So, um, you know, the concept of a draft where the worst team gets the best pick, you know, and sharing the wealth and revenue sharing where, you know, the broadcast rights will come in and every team gets an equal piece of the pie. Um, that, that, that's sort of a very um, different way. And, and when you try to take those same principles and apply it to government, people are, you know, like lose their minds over, you know, healthcare and things like that. So it's really, it's a unique place where you have that mix of like, like socialism as it comes to the competition, but also capitalist where there's more, single owner entities where you know like an nba team for example or an nfl team if we're looking at it they're owned by a person um and that person's desire for profit pretty much dictates how things go with the entire organization and its philosophy and etc so you oftentimes find that that those decisions will dictate how how the business is shaped so what we are really really good at here in the united states is commodifying and commercializing our sport, um, trying to find every last way to squeeze money out of the fans, either for profit or for competitive advantage. And, and oftentimes there's, there's, a, there's a real gray area between what, what um, some sports owners are, are motives really are. So um, by way of an example, I think something that I love going over with the students in Real Madrid is like, Let's say that you and I were to go to a Real Madrid match at Bernabeu. Okay, great. Um, how many times will we go into our wallet and take euros out during the match? And, you know, meaning beyond our ticket price, we would call it 75 or 100 euro, whatever. How many times are we going to be spending money when we get to the stadium? Versus if I were, you were to visit me in San Diego and COVID aside, we were to go to a Padres game, you know, what would I spend you know, hosting my friend Eugene at a baseball game on a, on a Friday night versus what would Eugene spend hosting me at a Real Madrid match. And I think the difference is staggering um, because the, the, the amount of, well, first of all, baseball has 81 home games. So there's, right. you know, they're going to play like, you know, sometimes in a week, they'll play all seven days. Um, whereas Real Madrid matches are an event, they're you know typically on the weekend, except for you know certain leagues, but uh, or, or competitions we during the week. But you know, it's just a very very different thing where 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 our sports are meant to to sort of. They, there's a lot of people that work for the organization whose sole purpose is to maximize the amount of money that they can get from fans. And whereas Real Madrid, they obviously have a whole commercial entities and I have very good friends that work there and they do great work on the sponsorship side and the marketing side and, and everything else, merchandising. But a lot of that gets pumped right back into the players to have a more competitive field on field product. So it's a, it's a very big difference there at, in terms of ownership. Um, and then there's just so many different levels of sport that we have here. Um, you know, I know that there's, there's very thriving university level sport throughout the world, but our university level sport is just so commercialized um, where you, you'll see you know, our, our university, for example, just broke or just reached an agreement to build a new American football stadium here in town. And, and it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and this is a, this is a university and um, you're looking at, there's so many issues with that when it comes to the players are considered amateurs. They don't receive compensation from, from the university or, or the NCAA for playing. So there's all these issues that, that come into it. And it's very, it's just a very unique sporting landscape. If you were to look at it, um, yeah. just overall, it's just very peculiar and, and very different from a lot of the rest of the world. And, you know, I'm not necessarily arguing that it's a very good thing. Um, I, I think it's nice that you can go to a Real Madrid match and buy your, your pipas outside and sit there and chew on those through, you know, you spend one Euro on a bag and then at, you know, halftime, like 90% of the stadium unwraps a foil baguette with tortilla in it. 
and you know everybody just gets fine but here it's like okay well let's go get sushi and then oh i didn't really i didn't really i'm not full let's go get this specialized barbecue place and let's have like three fifteen dollar beers and it all becomes a very expensive proposition so um it, it comes down to a lot of differences and 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 you know player salaries are, are a factor um you know there's minor leagues here there's universe and amateur athletics that, that all play into making it a very complicated place but um i think there's a lot that we could learn from both sides and i've really enjoyed my opportunities teaching and learning from folks like you about how sport thrives in other countries as well absent a lot of that commercialization right what i've seen scott is and we noticed, you know, Real Madrid building, the, rebuilding their now their stadium, or other clubs moving towards, you know, more smart stadiums. And it's definitely credit to to, to the to the U.S. Uh, to the American model, uh, you know, where you have more uh, food and beverage proposition, where you have more entertainment going throughout the game, you know, throughout the game and before and you know, in during the halftime. And so, when it comes to college sport. Do you think Europe can, and how, if, do you think Europe can implement what, what NCAA have done for the, for, the, for the years now? And if there's any opportunity, they could, they could do something like this, you know, in countries in Europe. I think, I think it's entirely possible. Um, I think one reason why sport on the women's side thrives in the United States, why our, our women's national team were the defending World Cup champions, um, and why you know women's basketball thrives in, in an, on a global stage, et cetera, um, is we have Title IX here, and it's it's been around for over 40 years now, and Title IX essentially says that um, there have to be equal spending, oppor or equal opportunity, um, and you cannot be biased on the basis of gender. So if there's an opportunity for men and it's been interpreted in the college athletic spaces, we have to have equal scholarships for men and women at universities. So what that did was it opened the door for a lot of women's programs across the country to be funded in a way that, that they never were before. And therefore, if you're a young woman, um, you're a football player and you're 15, 16, 17 years old, your primary goal is to earn a college scholarship to play football at the university level, which would either make it free, depending on the university, depending on the, you know, the amount of scholarship funds they have, or severely discounted um, because you're, uh, you're a member of their football team or their field hockey team or their softball team. So I think there's a lot of um, emphasis on women's sports because of that. And it's also, of course, sports has a lot of empowerment you know, you can gain a lot of by being involved in a team and learning leadership and all those other great qualities and fitness. But I think a lot of that is driven by, hey, if I can play the sport at a really great level, I can go and, and my college will be half price or my college will be free and I'll have, you know, a, a Nike equipment provided to me by the team, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, um, I, I just don't know enough about the European university system to see whether that would be functional. I know that a lot of major sports have their own developmental academies where you're kind of in the Valdebebas, like Real Madrid system, and you're going up through the ranks of the teams and things like that. I don't know that it would, that those, those high level elite players were, were probably not talking about going to play for a university. They're under like a, like a, a, a club entity. From a, from a very young age. Um, and that, that would include basketball and probably handball and a lot of other places. I'm not sure that they could necessarily seed it over that, but I think what the one breakdown of that is, and you can correct me from your personal experience, but I think our universities are much more costly than European universities. Yeah, and you're, you're correct. To, um, it's uh, definitely the difference in you know tuition fee, but on the flip side, uh, this, I, th I think in the US, there are universities who are lonely um, depending on those tuition fees. And I, I think uh, I listened on a podcast a few, few, few days ago. I think one of those universities are Purdue University or some, some university mm -hmm. from Indiana who are uh, depending 95% from tuition fees. And that's why with, you know, with all this COVID situation, if they're not restarting, they're, they're in... Um, you know, on, on campus, uh, 
classes, they might just, you know, be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and you look at, there are a lot of universities that can cost for a four year bachelor degree can cost around a quarter of a million dollars. And that's just the tuition. That's not room and board and food and housing. You know. So if you look at that and you, you see sport as an opportunity to either make that cost nothing or to make it close to half price or whatever it might be, I think that's probably why. But I think in European universities, um, I know at least 20 years ago when I studied at the University of Salamanca, uh, you know, the, the fees for a semester there were, were extremely minimal. And, and students would, it's not like this, this country here, the U.S. has a very major issue with student loan debt because people take out hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to finance their, their four-year education. And, and you just don't see that in a lot of other places. So I don't know. I think, I think the club system works really well um, because it, it, it obviously has its results. Like you, you, you see football players with, with just amazing talent coming out of you know, you know, the Netherlands and Germany and Spain and France and everything else. And, and um, here in the US, it's, it's very much flipped to the other side where it's privatized at the, at the youth level where you, you, know, you have to pay for uh, your son, Bobby or, or Sally to be on a club team and travel around and you have to pay for them to travel. And so the burden is placed a lot more on the parents. And if you ask them why they do it, it a lot of them would say, oh, it's to get Bobby or Sally that, that scholarship to, to Berkeley or that scholarship to UCLA. Um, or, or in a lot of cases, you know, get them into Berkeley or UCLA where, where we saw a big scandal with that last year um, with a lot of celebrities got in trouble for they were trying to use sport as a way to get themselves their kids into top tier universities right what are what are your thoughts on you know ncaa giving that opportunity to students with and that's the question that popped to my head right now um the um this the opportunity to students to you know monetize their brand and you know all their um endorsements with sponsors and so on like what's what's oh, your view on that oh boy um that there's actually a, a hearing going on or was what i woke up this morning um about in the u.s senate um with a lot of athletic directors testifying right now um you asked my opinion I, I think it's overdue i think you know this is something that you know players have been getting paid under the table and it's really shady it would be nice to get deals above board um, when you look at like a player like Zion Williamson who you know, went to Duke for just a year um, you know the amount that he could have monetized his Instagram following when he was just a teenager before going to Duke uh, was, was astronomical but to say that he can't et cetera, et cetera, it's just it, it, it seems like that time has come um, and we as as a society look at um, look at how we value these college players and i think their earning potential should be realized the same way that mine could have been realized i was not a college athlete um but i could have a part-time job during school and you know th there's always that analogy of like if you were in a, a rock band and you wanted to go play a concert on friday night that's fine like you, you no one's going to take that money out of your hand but if you're on the basketball team and someone wants your autograph you'll get severely punished for, for signing something or, or giving away memorabilia in exchange for something else. And I think it's just probably, you know, it's, it's going to happen w very slowly as things do that have a lot of bureaucracy involved and with a lot of money at stake. But I think it's, a, it's an idea that that's time has come and I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, you know, I'll be supportive of it. If I have marketing funds for our program, uh, I would certainly try to steer them toward college athletes, particularly women college athletes to, maybe want to study their masters at San Diego State. So I, I, would, I would certainly say, you know, these would be great students for my program. And if, if they can help me promote that uh, on their social media channels and in exchange for, you know, some payment, like I, I would be all about it. And I think a lot of other brands would line up to do the same. Right. In the context of pandemic, moving now you know, to nowadays, um, what are... Uh, and especially at SDSU, what are the plans for moving uh, the things forward? Like, definitely doing the, all the courses now online, if I'm not mistaken. And when are you planning to, if you have a plan to, to get on like, back to on-campus studies? And what about 
from the sports perspective, are any sports uh, gonna restart soon in your area or, or do you have any news on that? No, um, we are, the Cal State University system of which we're a part, there are 23 campuses in the state of California. I believe it's the largest group of campuses in the, in the country. Um, they announced very early on that we would be online through the fall. So my, my students in my program are currently taking online classes um, and we're, we're doing our best to, to give them a great experience. You know, we're having a lot of guests and uh, I might put you on the spot here to, to come in and talk to my students and tell them about, you know, your, your exploits in rugby and what's going on in Moldova and what, what's, what your career has been to date. Um, but I, I'm certain that will be online through fall because that's been announced. But right now we don't yet know about the spring. I think um, this is kind of fluid and, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the graphs, if you look at the number of cases, um, you know, in the U.S., it doesn't look good. There are a lot of places in the United States, California being one of them, that are continuing to see positive growth in cases. And um, here on July 1st, um, you know, that's, that's disheartening news. You know, we were, we were really worried about um, this back in mid-March when it first hit. Um, but it seems like we're going to be dealing with it for a very long time. And that's un really unfortunate. It, it makes me um, really sad, um, you know, I, that, that we're not necessarily... Um, doing the things that we need to do. There's, there's not, there doesn't seem to be a lot of great leadership um, and there, the virus will, will continue to affect us for a really long time. So I don't believe that any sports have announced at the university level that they'll be definitively, you know, marching on. I know that um, American football has, uh, practices have started at a lot of universities um, and then they're testing positive, play, a lot of players are testing positive. So it's this kind of back and forth. We're still in this weird holding pattern of waiting to see, you know, what will happen. We have the NBA looking to come back very soon in a bubble in Orlando. Uh, you have baseball saying that it'll have a 60 game season. You have, um, you know, American football continuing like they're going to play. Um, and and I, I just don't think we know. I think, the virus is going to tell us what we can and can't do. Um, but it becomes a very tricky situation where um, a lot of universities, as I mentioned earlier, like their American football players are unpaid and, um, you know, they're not unionized for, you know, et cetera. And as a result of the increased social awareness due to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, gaining a lot of steam in the months of May and June, um, you know, a lot of those players, particularly one comes to mind at UCLA in, in Los Angeles, um, those players had asked for like a third party medical opinion about whether they were, you know, uh, healthy enough to return to play, et cetera, related to COVID, among other concessions that they asked for um, in regards to social justice, which are long overdue. But that, that to me um, signals that this is going to have to, it's very thorny issue that's going to have to be very carefully looked at because, um, I think a lot of these players are, are going to be putting themselves in harm's way. And, and it's, it's difficult to look at that without thinking of their long-term health and, and worrying about them. And so, you know, this is uh, it's, it's a difficult situation that's going, that's going to, we're going to continue to deal with for a long, long time. Absolutely. When I checked and I'll give a little bit of, of context uh, for the next question. Um, I, I've been checking, you know, the trends of who are, um, what are the ages of the listeners of this podcast? And I saw a little, you know, multiple um, generations involved in, the, you know, on the other side and engaging with the, with the podcast. And uh, my next question, and I really would appreciate that. Um, what, from your from your experience and perspective, you've been with SDSU for four, for thirteen, fourteen years now you've um, educated multiple generations. What are the differences that you've experienced, you know, in two to three generation span during SDSU, uh, your career as, as SDSU? And what are the trends that you see in, uh, in, uh, in all of these, you know, um, behaviors? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, Let's see, I was 26 when I took over the program. So a lot of the students were pretty similar to my age. Um, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm going to be 40 this year in 2020. So uh, I'm 
substantially older than a lot of our youngest students at this point. Um, I noticed that nobody gets my Seinfeld references anymore. That's the biggest thing. Um, I make a lot of uh, Seinfeld. No, I used to. I, uh, but I think it's, it's kind of universal that um, the, the appreciation for sport has run through the entire history of the program. But um, one thing I've noticed you know, generationally is that the students of today in 2020 are a lot more globally aware than the students we had you know, 14, 15 years ago. Um, they grew up probably, or at least their formative years, teenage years, et cetera, where, where they could turn on the EPL on a Saturday morning and watch you know, global, global soccer. They, you know, they had um, World Cups when, when they were um, coming of age as sports fans were, were on TV with full broadcast, everything. And you know, that, that's, that just wasn't the case. You know, when I was growing up in the 80s, it was a lot harder to find and, and you had to really seek out global soccer for footballs, for example. Um, but I think overall, there are a lot more, obviously there's a lot more tech savviness. The social media wasn't a thing um, when, I, when, when I first started and now the, you know, the students are really dialed in on that. I think the, um, they're digital natives, so they're, they're used to grabbing information very quickly. Um, you know, they didn't have to, they never really grew up having to like go to the library and you know, sift through dusty volumes to find things to put in their term papers. They, they have it all um, at their fingertips. So I think that's a big one. Um, but overall, I, I've noticed that the trends are, are, are moving in the right direction. Like people know so much more about sports than they used to. And people know so much more about a wide variety of sports. So you see people open to doing so many more different things. Um, whereas in, in the early years of the program, it would be like baseball, NBA, and, and, and just kind of like those small windows. And now it's like, I have students that are, that are interested in working in rugby. And I'm like, okay, well, let me introduce you to our you know, alumni that work in rugby. So it's, it's um, I think the, 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 the open-mindedness is certainly increasing as the years go on. It's really fun to see. And uh, when it comes to communication and types of communication uh, for these different generations, um, do you see the younger generation being more into the digital rather than face-to-face -face or, you know, this type of communication and jumping, jumping into networking as well? You know, why is that important for the, gen the upcoming generations um, to implement whenever they want to get into sports business and not only? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So I would say that one of the things that we try to stress, because I am, you know, old with a capital O now, um, <laughs> is, you know, <laughs> a lot of people in this industry are from an earlier generation. So if you're looking at bosses or, or people that would be hiring managers, et cetera, um, just learning to communicate with those people in in ways in which they're comfortable versus the ways in which you might communicate with your friends. And I think a lot of that COVID aside, you know, that face-to-face -face interaction or, you know, picking up the phone and, and actually using it as a, as a device to make a call and, and speak to someone, um, that might not be something that people are very comfortable doing in a business sense. But we, as a program, try to train them on that and say, look, if you're, if you're going to go to work for an NBA team or something like that, you, you have to meet them on their level that you can't expect them to come to your level. So um, yeah, I think, I think stressing being a good writer and being a good communicator and, and knowing how to get out of your comfort zone for networking is really, really key because um, you know, a lot of, a lot of older old school people in the industry, whether they're in their forties, fifties, sixties, whatever, um, maybe they don't want to text or they'll be completely turned off by, a message that's really brief or, or that if you don't do things a real formal way. So I am old school in a number of ways. I mean, I, when our students arrive the first day on campus, I give them a stack of 50 note cards that say, you know, from the desk of Joe Smith and they have the university's logo on them. Um, and I encourage them to use them. And I think a lot of times because we're so used to just like, yeah, send me a WhatsApp. Okay. Yeah. Text me. When you do something that stands out, like you send a handwritten note, um, people notice and they are very thrilled that you took the time to do something like that. So I think that's something we, we stress in teaching that kind of networking. Um, now you don't have to use it, but at least you'll know how to do it. And if you, if you do run into someone who's you know, been around the block and has been in the industry since the eighties, you know, they might not be adapting to the times that quickly and they might be, they might be extending you a job offer because you took the time to write them a note. I mean, if, that, if that's what makes it, 
and starts your career, then I'm all over it. Like that sounds great. Then we'll, we'll go for that. Right. And from, from my perspective, I hear about the fact that the younger generations don't have patience and, you know, lack of patience and so on. I really think the, uh, the ecosystem made it this way. And, you know, like we're in the area, in the, in the, um, um, the digital era and, you know, the informational era and, you know, we have all the information and on this, on a, you know, on the tip of our toes and, you know, we, we can find that we can find out everything in a, in a split, in a split a second. And I think that's what, that's why, you know, the younger generations are thinking that, you know, we should get things faster, but also at the same time, it's, uh, it's the, the patient should be up there when it comes to uh, something you want to um, you want to achieve like if you have a dream that should be your uh, your long-term long-term goal and not you know rush into into getting into that because you know personally I'm all about a process it's not you know what you get there but the way to get there is really important mm -hmm. for me personally uh, mm -hmm. but now Scott to give ultimate um, value to, to the listeners uh, what would be your top skills um, for for someone to be in a better place to succeed and, you know, whenever they want to enter this industry? Sure. Uh, I, I would say take a page out of your playbook to, to go out and, and try something and put content out there. I mean, I heard about your podcast through Pedro's LinkedIn. You know, he said, I really enjoyed being on this episode and I reached out to you. I think being being active in the industry in which you want to work is really critical and it will get you noticed. And it's, it's oftentimes people have to put out content or produce product or produce work that's, that's not required that will get them noticed. So I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to get my students to do a lot of outside of class projects. Um, I know I preach this to the class in Madrid very early on and say, you know, you're here, uh, you have X amount of months as a student. Um, try to open doors with your .edu email address if you have one, or try to open doors and say, "Hey, I'm a student. Could I could I bother you for 30 minutes of your time? Could I uh, put together a project for you and and just try to show you what I'm capable of?" And and I I, I think I've seen so many jobs for my graduates come from things like that where they just have their name attached to something and it, and it looks great and it's good, good content. And the person who sees it says, wow, I have to hire her. She's amazing. And then next thing you know, when there's, it might not be that day. Like, and that's where you, where you're talking about instant gratification comes into play. Like, yeah, some of these things might not pay off for six months to a year, but I've seen it happen. And um, if you, if you do a project for an alumni of your program and, and they think it's good work, they might not have a job tomorrow, but the next time one is open, if you keep in touch and you stay top of mind with that person, it, it's going to be your phone that rings first. And, and that's the, the, the key thing to remember is, you know, there's a lot of people that want to work in this industry. Um, there's a lot of programs like yours and mine and those around the world and, and jobs are scarce. And when they're posted, hundreds of people apply for them. So I think the key is to, to have the personal connection with someone for them to either hire you or vouch for you to the person who is hiring. And, and I think that's, that's very difficult because you don't see the payoff at all in the beginning and you don't never know if it, the payoff's going to come, but you have to sort of trust that, okay, if I put enough good stuff out there, something great will happen. And that, that's, that's um, I think for students, it's just the most important thing other than, you know, getting good grades and learning the material. It's, it's, you got to be a known commodity and you have to, you have to get your name out there and say, you know, wow, this person does a good job. Now, if somebody listens to this podcast, they're going to first wonder why I talk so long, but the, you know, hopefully they take away on your end, like, wow, this guy did put a lot of work in and prepared some really great questions. And, and they're going to think, wow, like that guy's, that guy's fantastic. So it's, it's something that people need to keep in the back of their minds as they're looking for a job, like showing that, you know, the industry, is, is, is half the battle. It's, it's really, really important. And how, no, cause I'll bring Pedro's words here. You mentioned him. Um, he's a top skill called this way. He said about versatility and how important is, um, a person to be skilled in multiple areas. 
that will you know ultimately will bring ultimate value to the to the to the organization how do you think that's important at um because personally i i truly believe that's important when it comes to um to a smaller organizations where you know um for example a minor league baseball team might have um you know a dozen of of work of, of employees but then when we're talking about an nfl franchise you might have hundreds thousands of employees and you know you you're only hired to do one thing what what are your thoughts on that oh, yeah. Pedro is always right, first and foremost. So, um, I would agree with Pedro that, that versatility is key, um, even if you're going to work for a, a large organization. You know, I, I spoke this morning to one of our alumni um, who does, has an analytics role, um, but he's within the corporate partnerships department of the defending Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs. Um, his name's Armand Alwalia. If you, uh, if you ever want to interview him, I guarantee he'll be on the podcast in four seconds. So he's a great guy, great networker. But we were talking about that exact topic because COVID hitting has made all of us kind of recalibrate and, and try as best we can to prepare our students when they eventually become graduates and enter this post-pandemic uh, workforce, you know, we want to make them as versatile as possible. And for me, that means hearing from a wide variety of people, um, you know, tomorrow we'll have a woman come and, and speak with them over Zoom about her career in, in community relations for the San Diego Padres and how, how teams represent themselves in the community and make donations to youth sports and work with hospitals and the business community, et cetera. But at the same time, I'm also talking about getting an Excel class ready so that my students are very good with pivot tables and they're very, now an MBA is nothing if not a, the most versatile possible degree. We make you take accounting, we make you take finance, but we also make you learn to write and do take marketing and have, have thoughts on Colin Kaepernick and Nike and all those things. So it's, it's a very versatile space because I don't know where my students are gonna go. And I think a lot of them don't know themselves, but I at least have to give them as many tools as we can to be flexible, to enter in. Because if a small, or like you said, a small organization like a minor league baseball or um, uh, major league rugby, you know, their, their front office is a, a very small lean organization, but we have three alumni that work there. Now, the, the term wearing a lot of hats gets overused, but you know, I guarantee those folks are like talking with a, a company about a, a, which ball they're gonna use in match play and then another call they're going to talk about an invoice and then another call they're going to talk about you know a, a new franchise name and whether that you know you can market that name in that market or what so so wearing a lot of hats is absolutely critical and, and what better way to learn to do that than to do it when you're in school and to try to try to get as most of uh, as much um skills as you can build and that includes communication and soft skills so not just software it's just how good are you at, at, at asking questions and answering questions absolutely and um what uh, let's let's move let's move on to uh the tools when it comes to networking right um i noticed on because I'm, I'm i'm a linkedin guy and you know i'm uh, i'm surfing there a lot um i noticed sdsu has around 280 um thousand followers of which 90 percent are, are the alumni of the university like, and then on the flip side, I noticed, you know, European universities with, you know, uh, five to 10% of that total. And what do you think, why is different in the, you know, in your case, guys, you know, having that huge following and huge alumni percentage being on LinkedIn, being present, what is the key and why do you think LinkedIn is, you know, the right tool for networking? Oh, good question. Um, I, I think networking as a whole is much more prevalent in the United States than in other parts of the world, uh, per my experience. And, and having taught a class that focused on networking and said, you know, this is how I do it and how my alumni do it. And here in California, and, and I understand that it's different in different parts of the world, and I, I love learning, you know, how, how, how it is different. Um, I think LinkedIn is, is sort of an offshoot of, of our different way of approaching networking 
which is just like, hey, I'd like to meet you and we can talk about this opportunity and maybe it would benefit both of us. And that, that's just kind of the digital version of our philosophy of, yeah, how can I help you? Great. And, and you know, I've had students you know, furrow their brow when I tell them about informational interviews and they're like, uh, you know, someone in my home country or wherever would never respond to that email. And here it's almost like, you know, only, only a very small percentage of people would, would just look at something like that and be like, Ugh. now if you're too busy or, you know, life is getting in the way, of course, that, that's one thing, but there are, it's rare that you would find an executive who, who just blanket says no to anyone asking him or her for his or her time that it's just part of our culture where we're, we're more open to like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, do you want some help or, uh, Oh, this is a startup and you need a break. Like, let me see how I can assist you. And let me, and, and, and that's not to say that that doesn't take place in other cultures. It's just, we do it a lot more seemingly with strangers uh, or people that we're connected to. Now to, to get to your question about universities, I think a lot of it has to do with our deep, deep rooted pride in our universities. And I, I, uh, I'm just coming up with it now, so I won't have a very articulate answer, but I think part of that comes to do with the, has to do with the athletic teams. Um, if, if lots of inter-university competition. So I can tell you that I really love Georgetown Hoyas basketball and Georgetown Hoyas sports of all forms. And I really, really hate the Syracuse Orange. Um, that, that hates strongly. I really do not care for the Syracuse Orange and their, and their athletic teams. Um, that's a rivalry that's gone on, you know, for, for almost 40 years. So I think that has a lot to do with it. It has also has to do with it that a lot of our colleges are residential. So when you went to university, did you leave home at 17 or 18 and go live in a dormitory or did you stay at home and go to school? Well, personally, um, I went to university and, you know, the bachelor, um, it was in my hometown. So I had to, right. you know, I stayed with my parents. Exactly. So for us, like I left Rhode Island and went to Washington, DC. My friends left Rhode Island and went to Pennsylvania or New York or Massachusetts or whatever. So we leave home and it becomes essentially like a, you know, for lack of a better term, it's like a summer camp, but you're, you're, you're living in dormitories. You're, you're, in a small confined space, you're learning, you're, you're, you're making mistakes, you're making, uh, and there's all that part of it where that's a formative experience that in its own right. So I think the pride in the university has a lot to do with that as well. Um, they also ask us for money. It's also really expensive. So, you know, if you make a, if you make a $200,000 purchase uh, and you, you want to buy a $200,000 Ferrari, you're probably going to be a Ferrari guy for life. And you're probably going to wear the Ferrari hat and you're really, really proud of that Ferrari. And I think part of that, um, you know, not every university costs that much, of course, but I think if you take all of those things into account, I think then you see why Americans are very fond of their universities. And then on the flip side of that, how universities are a lot bigger businesses, the athletic department, I just said, you know, hundreds of million dollars of dollars for a stadium, um, you know, athletic coaches can make, you know, in the millions, uh, to coach men's basketball or, or American football. So you look at all of those factors and universities go, wait a second, we need money. So, I mean, if I rummage through my mail here, I assure you there's, okay, here's one. Um, this is a 360 magazine from San Diego State University. So I, I know that Georgetown asked me for, for money you know, every few months. Um, electronically, they call me. Sometimes they have students call me and tell me, hey, I'm a student and I'd like to, you know, that's all part of the game is that it's a very big business with big money behind it. So there's, there's a lot of that, like, oh, you went to Georgetown. I went to Georgetown. Great. Let's connect. And, and that um, the alumni status is something that, that is very, very unique to our networking. So I think that would explain, you know, the, and the, the school is huge. I mean, San Diego State has something like 35,000 students right now. Like that's enormous. Scott, what are your thoughts on networking events? Like personally, I, I I love them because you know you have an and um, um, you know a huge opportunity to meet you know uh, other professionals and why not executives whenever they they're invited to speak in those events. Like, do you think that's that's a good investment? Personally, I'll give a tip here to to the listeners. Uh, I like to reach out to the organizers and. Um, uh, ask them if I can volunteer. So, you know, whenever that, yeah. that ticket is, you know, $300, which for a student might be, you know, <laughs> a lot. Um, 
I would, I would ask to volunteer and this is what I've done, you know, for, for the, for my last three networking events and it's worked great. You know, you get hand on experience of, on how uh, these kind of events are, are organized, but what are your thoughts? Like, do you think it's worth, for example, if you can got, if you cannot get as a volunteer, like, would you, would you, um, advise your, um, your students to get to those kind of events? I say it depends. Um, because not everybody thrives in that type of environment. And if you're going to spend the money, you should probably make it worthwhile. So you have to look within and decide if you're the type of person who could benefit from that. I know you're not shy. I know that you, you would come up to me after class and say, Hey, I want to talk to you about that thing you mentioned, or I want you to see this thing I'm working on. Or you know, if you're a wallflower, um, if you're a person who really likes to hang in the back of a crowd and not, not say much or you're introverted i don't think it's worth it at all because just going there is not going to get you what you want it's you have to go and you have to uh well not right now but you, you know normally shake hands you have to you have to meet people and really make a connection quickly and if that's not your style then i would say don't spend the money because i've had students ask me like oh should i fly to this conference in boston should i go to this event in new york I and mean, we're out in san diego we have plenty of events on the west coast but um a lot goes on on the east coast and i'd say to them like you know by the time you get done with that it's a thousand dollars maybe fifteen hundred two thousand dollars do you are you the kind of person who can make that level of investment pay off and if they're like mm, not really then i say okay well why don't you meet one person that you could really impress? And instead of flying out to Boston for, you know, two days of hearing from, you know, Adam Silver and Malcolm Gladwell and sitting in the crowd and not talking to anybody, why don't you reach out to one alum of our program and say, Hey, is there a project I could work on for you? I'm going to spend the whole weekend on it. And would you mind going over it Monday with me? And that's such a, it's so much a better use of your time. Um, than, and of course it's free to do that. It's, you know, it doesn't cost anything. So I think it just depends what kind of person you are. Right. Um, what about, you know, with all this COVID situation where, you know, more, more of our times being locked at home, um, are there any new podcasts that, would, that you would recommend or, you know, any shows or any books that you started lately? Like, oh, you... boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, which, where do I start? Okay, so. Um, Except one... the 50 Procast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the e-procast should be uh, the first thing everyone does in the morning is check to see if there's a new one, first and foremost. Um, I'm, I'm talking to one of our, our uh, black alums about this book, and we're going to do a, a book club with our students. It's called We Matter, Athletes and Activism by Atan Thomas. Um, and oddly enough, I just told you that I didn't care for uh, Atan Thomas's uh, university uh, five minutes ago, but he's a wonderful... Um, wonderful social activist, uh, former athlete, and he talks to all, all types. So I would say books like that for here in the United States, that, that moment is it's time and it's overdue for us to, to focus on books like that. Um, as far as podcasts, uh, I have a, a, a list of about 60 sport business podcasts I'll happily share with you. Um, but the ones that, that I get to every morning are the, are the sports business journal, that's t typically U.S. focused. Bloomberg Business of Sports typically U.S. focused, um, and one that my program supports uh, that that your listeners might enjoy is Front Office Features. So um, that's Chris Valenti with the with Fenway Sports Group and Rob Crane of the Pawtucket Red Sox, um, but it's geared toward people looking to break into sports, um, and I think their audience really overlaps well with my my student audience because um, it's they work in this industry and they're, they're giving tips and advice on how to get into this industry. So um, I think that, that would be one that I'd recommend uh, for those looking to, to break in um, yeah. on the sports business side. Actually, I'll, I'll uh, post them in the, in the uh, episode notes for, for uh, the guys to, to go and check them out as well. You mentioned uh, three to four, two out of those three I'm listening. I'm, I'm a constant listener, you know, the sports business journal and the, the Bloomberg Good. sports. Uh, actually, I'm, uh, I have to give you credit and say huge thank you because I got into the podcast game because of you. I remember first class with you in the in the uh, Madrid NBA. Uh, you mentioned not books, not everything, but you mentioned you know the uh, 
the list of podcasts because you know it's i really love the format and you know you can do multiple things and also having the headset on just uh, uh going and listening to them and uh, get a lot of value and if you're also you know fluent in, in you know english or other languages you can just put like 1.5 speed and you just yep. <laughs> listen to more value <laughs> yeah well i'm playing with my guests uh the reaction game so i have to uh, ask you five things I'll tell you five things and you have to give me your first reaction, right? Great, let's do it. <laughs> uh, Real Madrid. White. SoFi Stadium. Ooh, Roberto. One of my alumni works there and I, I always <laughs> think of uh, Roberto. San Diego Padres. Oh, Veronica. I'm, inter I'm interviewing her tomorrow about her decade in community relations with the Padres. Beautiful. Um, sports card. Sports cards, upper deck. They're here in San Diego. And last but not least, XFL. XFL. Oh, Steve, one of our alumni was consulting with them for a while. Steve Guerra, you know him well. He taught in Madrid as well. Uh, he worked with the XFL for a time and, uh, and did some consulting work with them. It's a real shame. I wish that it could have worked out. But they're, uh, maybe they'll have a 3.0. Who knows? Me too. I mean, hopefully they get back on, on you know, getting that another chance. They, they started well. I mean, I, I enjoyed watching mm -hmm. some, some of the games. Uh, you know, the, um, the way they engaged with, with communities and, uh, you know, individual uh, uh, franchises, they did a great job. But, you know, unfortunately, COVID-19 uh, had to uh, stop all the movement for this year. So mm -hmm. hopefully next year will be the one for them as well to re restart their season. Um, and uh, Scott, anything in, in, you know, in the end, just to, to wrap, wrap up things here, any... Uh, last words for for the youth out there who wants to break into the industry? Yeah, I would say to follow Eugene's example because this is a guy who hears something in class, you know, writes it down, starts listening to podcasts, you know, starts his own podcast. I mean, this is such a great success story. And, you know, I'm really excited to see where your career goes and and to be a part of your network moving forward and and, and maintain our friendship because it's really wonderful to see how – far you can get in this industry if you put in the effort. So I would say follow the host here and keep in touch and listen to him. He seems to be doing it all right. And to give ultimate uh, value to the guys who wants to get in touch with you, what's the best platform to get to get to, you know, to get to know you more? Oh, I, I'm LinkedIn. Um, it's, let's see, it's a uh, linkedin.com slash in slash Scott Minto, S-C-O-T-T-M-I-N-T-O. Um, you know, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. We're at SDSU Sports MBA on all social. Um, so certainly connect with me and the program. Um, and yeah, really appreciate uh, anybody who reaches out that, that's listened to this. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Scott, for, uh, for uh, you know, providing all this huge rally to the listeners and uh, also for, uh, for taking the time and, um, and joining me on this, uh, on this podcast. I'm sure uh, guys will uh, will uh, get into uh, will slide into your LinkedIn DMs. Call it this there you go. That's <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks Great so time. much. It's really nice to chat with you, and we'll we'll talk again soon. Yeah, sounds good, Scott. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye.